Welcome to another Bandology interview. Bandology is a Canadian nonprofit dedicated to more music for more kids via education, collaboration, and community. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucas Redwood, and I'm the manager of music and learning with Bandology. I'm joined here today with Tim Podosik, founder of Sonic Union Records and Supercrawl Music Festival. How are you doing today, Tim? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so can you start off, can you, by describing a bit about your background uh, within music? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, pretty classic story as far as I think things go, typical of um, how people get started in the business, but just always uh, immersed in music throughout my life. Growing up with my dad, I uh, was an engineer, but played wedding bands and um, the Croatian instruments. So I learned how to play a bunch of Croatian instruments when I was young and then uh, dovetailed into learning how to play drums. My grandparents owned a bar and uh, the bands would leave their gear um, overnight because they'd come and do a residency for like a weekend or a month or whatever. So the only instrument that uh, I didn't have to turn on was the drums. <laughs> so um, I could sit on the stool and pound away on the snare drum and my grandma would put uh, Beatles music on over the bar PA system. And I just play along to it while she was cleaning in the morning. So. Um, in high school, I just played with friends and cover bands and same in university. And then uh, I met my business partners, uh, Mark and Sandy, um, after university and Gary. And we all kind of started an original band uh, together. Mark and Sandy had already started it. I joined the band with Gary. And then it kind of just dovetailed from there, turned into wanting to release some music. So we released it ourselves and started a label and then local bands noticed that we did a pretty good job of doing it. And then they asked us if we could put records out for them. And then it just sort of continued to cycle from there. We were putting some music out for some local bands. We went from Hamilton to Burlington and then we started gigging in Toronto and meeting Toronto bands. So we signed some artists from Toronto because it had a, the label had a, you know, kind of cool vibe in the nineties and, um, and it just sort of, it just escalated from there. Very cool. Very cool. How does it work within a label? Um, well, I mean, you know, it's sort of changed over the years for sure. Um, the early days we were extremely active uh, with everything. We basically you know, tried to learn and do every aspect of, of the job of releasing a record from, you know, designing the advertising to uh, doing all the PR, calling the radio stations, calling magazines and zines. And uh, this is before blogs and before the internet, even, um, you know, to get press for our bands and booking shows. We did all that sort of stuff with in, and in conjunction with our early artists. And then as things transitioned over the years, we still know how to do all those things and learn them. But now I feel like we're more a team building organization where we hold the reins of you know, helping the artists get music uh, completed, recorded, finished, uh, have feedback uh, and talk with our artists about, you know, uh, developing their music. Um, obviously, it's all up to them. They can take our feedback or not. You know, we're quite open to letting them do what they do. So we're very hands off, like as we were in the 90s, too. Uh, I prefer to you know, just I'll always comment, but I prefer to get a finished release or demos that are really great and thought through uh, prior to hearing anything um but now I'd say yeah like we're more team building so we're finding people that we can work in conjunction with so we're hiring PR teams now we're hiring radio pluggers we're hiring DSP pluggers we're hiring all these different avenues of people to help build our artist career because we frankly don't have the expertise um or uh, you know or really quite frankly the time to like manage all these different elements like you want to hire somebody like for example uh we have a new release for Danko Jones so we're putting out a second single for Danko Jones but I've hired a radio like a professional radio tracker plugger to do the commercial radio work for Danko Jones so in Canada and the U.S. so he's 
knows who all the rock radio stations are. He mm. deals with these programmers on a weekly basis. Whereas like we would have one Danko Jones record a year and maybe two or three rock records a year. And we just couldn't keep the same relationships up. So hiring people to do these specific jobs actually helps elevate, you know, the, the, the callbacks, I guess. So, you know, Danko's had a top 10 single at rock radio in Canada, which is great. Um, and, you know, so you get real, solid results when you work with other teams and we just manage them all and ensure that the team in Canada knows what's happening with the team in America and America knows the key things that are happening in Canada and the same thing with the European teams and every record is a little bit different um, depending on the status of the artist really like a Danko Jones we are collaborating with a German label so there's a German company oh, that's wow. doing all the work in Europe and we're doing all the work in North America and we have a weekly call with them and the management team and the band to, you know, determine this whole course of action. Like when will the tour dates be in Canada? When will the tour dates be in America? When will that be, when will the tour dates be in Germany and other European countries so that we can coordinate all the marketing plans around what we're doing. So really it's just, you know, finding great people to work with um, and trusting them to, you know, do their job well and, and finding people that are motivated to work with the artists that we you know, believe in, right? So that's that's part of it too. It's sometimes, um, and sometimes you make the wrong choice. You can find somebody in, you know, a PR company in America, for example, that just might not be the right fit. They seem keen, but they just, you know, they can't open the right doors. And sometimes it's because the passion's not there. And sometimes it's just because it's the record might not be, the timing might not have lined up well, you know? So it's, there's a lot of variables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What led you to want to run Superquell and also how is Superquell kind of adapted throughout uh, the pandemic? Um, well, I mean, it's an interesting story, you know, Supercrawl in itself. Um, we've always been in the live business. So even from day one, we were, because we were learning the business when we started in the nineties um, and into the two thousands and the whole way through really, uh, we always promoted shows. So we would work with other promoters in town or we would rent rooms and do our own shows. We do anniversary shows. We do release shows for our artists and be very active in that. So we always had our foot in the door with the live business. Um, and I guess, you know, there's a couple things, confluences that kind of came together for Supercrawl. One was I was on a business trip in New York and, um, you know, meeting people that we're partners with and we're, we work with in, in New York City, um, a couple agents and a, and a couple lawyers. And I decided to stay over the weekend because New York City's awesome. And so I wanted to, you know, go see some shows and uh, hang out in New York for the weekend. So I stayed. And then on Sunday, I was just walking Manhattan, you know, like I was in Soho <laughs> and I was walking around and, you know, taking it all in and going popping into shops and I ran across a street closure and I was like wow this is quite cool I looked down like the streets and I'm like this is looks huge so I was like I decided I'm gonna walk this street closure and find out where it starts or ends and then walk to the other thing the other side of it and so I uh, I did walk it and then I walked back and as I was walking back I was counting the blocks right like how many blocks are they closing in Manhattan right mm -hmm. And it was close to 40. Oh, wow. It was just a giant festival. And it was like, you know, kind of, uh, it felt a lot like, but on a much bigger scale, like what we had been doing in Hamilton organically with like our crawl, a bit different. Like there's lots of vendors and like, you could tell that it was like semi-organized and there was police and, you know, barricades and all that kind of stuff. But it was just the coolest vibe. It was just people hanging out, walking the streets and, grabbing something to eat and buying things from vendors and there were some street musicians and no like official big stages or anything like that you could tell it was like just um, a pop-up style type thing and I thought man if they can close this many blocks in Manhattan we've got to be able to close streets and do something in Hamilton because you know and my thinking was there's already an art crawl that had started and was sort of developing organically um, it was quite small still at that time that was happening monthly on James Street North. And I kind of came back and I knew everybody that was basically participating in our crawl. And I got everybody around a table and I'm like, would, would everybody be cool if we like popped up a stage and 
tried to get some other types of like vendors that weren't um, businesses on the street and sort of populated some food on the street as well and closed the street and put some music on for a night. And everybody was like, yeah, that'd be cool. Cause we thought what we could do is if we did that, maybe it would build awareness to art crawl and more people would come out to art crawl. It was just an experiment. So that's how it kind of came to be. And we did it and uh, it was raining, it was October, but we still had about 3000 people that came out on that one block closure and the city was uh, on board with us doing it. And so, you know, and it was a great success and we we're like, okay, cool. And then we just moved on to our day-to-day -day work, you know, like we weren't, we didn't pay that much attention to, we knew it was successful. And then we were just going to see how many more people would come down to our crawl every month. And maybe that would have been it. Um, but then we kind of got to the point where we should, we thought we should do it again and we should do it again. And then we just, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And then we established a not-for-profit. So super crawls its own not-for-profit so that we could apply for other different types of funding and get sponsorships from corporations. And then we've just built this festival from, you know, an investment from our company of about $30,000 in the first year to now our last, our last official full year, the budget for super crawls about 1.7 million now. Wow. So we've taken this tiny little experiment and gone from 3000 people also up to, you know, over 200,000 people come on a weekend to the festival. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and so how it's kind of dovetailed now over the last couple of years with COVID is that we're running live streams and we're trying to do whatever we can with some of the funding that we're still receiving to try to still bring entertainment to people, but in a different way. Um, and, you know, it's, it's okay you know like I, that's that's a little like we're doing our very best and i think we're providing a really high quality experience for what it is but it's still an experience that you know i have to say it sucks you know like it just live music is meant to be in the room on the street wherever you're going to be in a park at a venue experiencing it having the you know pa just pour over you and the people that you're with and the fun experience of like whatever it is that you're into right so um ultimately i can't wait until we get and get back to that real in-person feel and you know we're slowly doing that now our live streams that we're running at this point in september and through the fall are 50 per people in person so that's better than no people in person yeah yeah um and uh you know they've got a bit more vibe and it's cool and it's nice for artists to be able to perform and actually have somebody applause, like some applause happening in the room after they <laughs> perform a show, a song. It's just really weird to be in a, a live room when you've got a big venue, because we're doing it in a pretty big place that holds 500 people. And the band plays the last note of a song and it's just silence, right? And mm. it's, it's, a, and it's a unique experience for the artists because they have to engage people on through this type of medium that they don't have they're not even having a conversation it's just like they just know there's people out there on the internet somewhere watching them and they have to be able to you know have that back and forth which is a really hard thing to do mm -hmm. yeah. do they get to see like because i know with like facebook and stuff so they they don't get to see like any of the the comments or is there like a, i don't know how it works like is there like a screen or something that they get to see some of the the things that are or it's just they just play and um you know that kind of thing most just play we've had a couple that have had like the smaller ones if you've done like private ones first you know our artists on our label they would engage you know through zoom or through facebook and like actually have conversations with people look at comments reply to those comments but in a bigger situation where you're in a venue it's a little bit harder um we've done q and a's afterwards so that they can engage with with audience that way um and those have worked out pretty well that's a different you know it's a it's a it's a more fun you know situation there, but there's no real engagement when they're playing a song you know they could look at a screen and see a bunch of faces in like little you know <laughs> yeah, lines like the, of yeah. cubes it's, but it's just like you're basically just looking at a tv and you can't really you know can't really feel it you know or how engage with it mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um 
so with uh, bandology, we talk a lot about, and with Supercrawl, you've you've helped out a lot of um, artists and and younger musicians as well. Um, and we think it's very very important through music education to help uh, younger um, younger artists and, and everything. So my question to you is, uh, why do you why do you believe music education is important? Well, it's it's vital. You know, um, I don't know. Like I would definitely be a different person if I didn't have that opportunity back in school when I was in school. So I, and, you know, I think there's still an element of it in public school, but it's nowhere near what it was when I was in school or, mm -hmm. you know, even when my parents were in school. So I think, you know, a lot of it is resting on parents to get their ch children involved. And on some level that, that there's an ability to do that on certain social you know, <clears throat> strata, you know, where, but there's other people that don't have the ability or the means to be able to do that as easily. So I think it has to be implemented at the school level. I think it's vitally important that kids get, you know, to get to touch that, to understand instruments, to at least try it. And, you know, it might not really do much for a lot of kids, but it does do something and it, and it gives you a understanding or peace of mind of what's actually happening. Um, you know, what talent it takes to actually, you know, pull a, a song, make a song happen or learn how to play an instrument properly. So I think it's vitally important. And I wish there was more in schools. And I know there's lots of organizations that are trying to bring uh, music education to young, young kids and you know, middle-aged kids, and high school level kids. Um, I just think uh, without that, it's a huge, um, it's a huge missing link. I think it makes kids smarter too. Like, you know, if you learn how to play an instrument or understand how to read music, um, even if you're not good, I still think <laughs> that can happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, 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 there's instruments I'm good at and others that there's just no way I could do. I just, I don't have the, um, the drive and, or the ability, you know, to actually be good at whatever, playing a horn or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those, in, those horn instruments and everything, they take a lot of, and all instruments, they take a lot of practice and skill for sure. Absolutely. To, uh, yeah. I mean, so it's just, I think it's just so, so important that kids get exposed to music. It's, it just, it broadens the mind. Absolutely. All right. So that was like, that was my last official question for you and then we like to do a little uh fast set of fast five questions at the end for everyone so here we go with the fast five so first fast five question is favorite movie soundtrack uh the commitments uh it's like all kinds of like old old style you know blues music done by our, by a, an irish band thrown together basically uh great movie great soundtrack very cool how about instrument you wish you played uh well i could kind of sort of mess around on a guitar but i wish i was actually you know a proper guitar player i do have a guitar i play some croatian instruments that resemble guitar but um i'd love to be able to actually just you know, be able to pick it up and jam with people, which I can't. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, how about your favorite concert you've attended? I think that, um, yeah, my favorite concert was one that wasn't one that was open to the public, but it was a story where we were working with um, a fella named uh, Frank Black, who is the lead singer of a band named The Pixies or quite oh, yeah. an instrumentally huge indie rock success story from America, like massive band. They toured with U2 and the Rolling Stones in their heyday. They were signed to Sony, big deal. Um, so Frank Black has a whole pile of solo projects. And at, the t at this time, late 2000s, we were working with him and we released about seven albums from him. He's a bit prolific. Um, and the Frank Black and the Catholics were doing a tour of Canada and they needed somewhere to rehearse. And we had this like totally illegal venue on the third floor of our building that we were putting shows on in. And we actually had no license. We were just doing it. Um, yeah, Cause we, you know, we thought it would be fun and cool. Um, and we weren't serving booze or anything. They were just, 
but it's, we still shouldn't have been doing them, but we did it anyway. Anyway, the space was up there and it had a stage and a PA system and we had mentioned him because he was coming up and they needed somewhere to rehearse for a week. And we had anything we said, well, we've got this space. Do you want to use it? And he was like, yes. So they came up and every day for a week, we'd sit in the office and work and they'd come at around noon and they'd rehearse till six. And like, honest to God, their set list was like, the, like it was the length of an entire wall like it was oh wow like hundreds of songs like I had no idea how like I remember being in a band and you know whatever having a, a list of you know 20 or 30 songs that we'd have to choose from and being like oh how does that one go again oh yeah okay got it right but just hundreds of songs in their catalog um and uh, they'd come and they'd rehearse like all day long and we like through the floor you know we were listening to Frank Black and we're just like every day was just like oh this is like just surreal you know to have this happening and then at the end of the week he was like oh I'm going to throw you guys a, a friends and family party like a show and so we had 50 people come and sit up there and you know have some snacks and watch them play for two hours and it was just it was unbelievable wow yeah yeah it's almost like that reminds me of the or the type of vibe similar to when you talk about you know not places that are um not uh allowed like kind of blocked off private concerts reminds me of like the uh the beatles kind of rooftop vibe yeah like, yeah. like that kind of thing yeah <laughs> it was, it was close but not quite that. not, not, not quite, quite but that, that was yeah <laughs> but yeah that was a good uh yeah um how about um uh favorite artists um hmm i don't know if i actually uh would be my favorite artist uh, that's like an impossible question to, <laughs> to answer but i mean yeah for if i like yeah if i say canadian it's rush if i say it's rush yeah yeah i mean they're uh yeah being a drummer it's like you know you have to go you have to go that way right <laughs> absolutely yeah um and last uh but not least how about uh dream vacation spot well hawaii i've been there a couple times already and i i would love to just stay there um it's basically heaven on earth so any any of the islands it doesn't really matter i've been to several of them and it's just yeah it's just an incredible place yeah i went to the the main one i think maui or the just yeah. the the main island it was pretty it was pretty cool yeah all right well thank you so much tim for uh for joining us today uh for this interview it was great to hear some of your perspectives on uh being in in a record label as well as um uh just organizing super crawl and everything cool thanks. awesome thanks for thanks for getting in touch with me i enjoyed it Thanks for joining us. If you like what you heard, you can learn more about our organization at bandology.ca, which features information about music education, advocacy and research, and our play a gig and band camp programs. Follow us on social media for more videos, performance and interviews on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube.